And the whole film is full of that. We know what a tracker is. You do not have to mansplain that to us, okay? <laughs> hey, guys, guess what? What? It's our 50th edition of Flickering Dreams. Woo, 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 woo. Well, and, only th- and only three of us to celebrate. Uh, only three of us to uh, celebrate. Oh, jeez. Wow. <laughs> but it's number 50, no birthday cake or anything, but uh, yeah, Aww. we made it, to, made it to 50, but there you go. <laughs> so on Flickering Dreams, I'm joined here uh, by just the original two, right? Scott Forbes of the Forbes Film and TV Review on Facebook and Andy Godfrey from Sorted Magazine and Connect Radio. And I'm Bob Mann from One Man's Movies and BBC Radio Solent. We've got a relatively short lineup for this edition of Flickering Dreams. There's actually not an awful lot come out at the cinema that's new. And we reviewed The Iron Claw last week. Uh, You can go back and watch that if you missed it. So we're looking at one film, sorry, two films. One film that's out in the cinema at the moment, and that is Gassed Up, that came up last Friday. And Andy is going to talk about that, I think he's the only one who's seen that which is going to be a common theme for this week because we've all been quite busy we're also going to look at a new film on disney plus called sun coast which i think only i have seen we are looking at another film on netflix which we've actually all seen and that is a documentary called lover stalker killer and andy is going to look at a new film coming out on Friday starring uh, his name's gone Mix Med- Mix oh, my name's gone Mads, um, Mads Mickelson I wanted to say Mendelsham but <laughs> Mads Mickelson yes yeah called yeah. The, promised the promised land, land. right yeah. so we are going to kick off I think with gassed up which I say is in cinemas at the moment um Andy can you introduce the clip for us Certainly. We are in inner London. We are with a gang of motorbike riders who at the beginning are racing around the city, pinching mobile phones and laptops out of people's hands. But something more sinister is about to be afoot. Here's a clip. You treat this like a job, you can have anything that you want. Do you want this kind of money in your hand? Hey, 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 Spots, come on, save my bro. Make some noise! It's Spots, you don't want to see flames. Two gas up when we enter the place. Oh, it's a fucking robbery! I've got to get paid! Where's the stuff from the jewelry shop? Fuck, let's go! I don't care if every single one of you dies. I want my fucking jewels now. Yeah, so this is a new British crime filler. It's one of those films that comes out in cinemas, I think, could easily slip under the radar but I didn't want to let it because it's really, really good. It's directed by uh, George Am Ponash and stars, amongst others, uh, a terrific performance by Stephen Odjubler. Uh, He plays Ash, who's a member of this gang who are stealing mobile phones and laptops for an Albanian gangster uh, in central London. The gang is fairly close-knit. Ash has got a great motive for doing what he's doing. His mother is a drug addict. And he's trying to raise money to get her into rehab. Uh, He's also having to look after his sister because his mother, who we never see, by the way, is continually uh, on a high. The film takes a very dark turn when one member of the gang dies uh, in a particularly nasty way. And the Albanians decide that they want to step up a gear. They need the gang to stop robbing jewellery shops. And then Ash is conflicted as to whether he wants to continue to do this or not, because also the police are closing down on them as well. It's a tight, gritty, low-key, low-budget British thriller. It had me gripped from the start. I thought it was really, really good, really worth seeing. And I think it's a shame that it's probably going to be one of those films that not a lot of people are going to go and see at the cinema. But honestly, I think it's worth seeing on the big screen. There's some great cityscapes of London. From quite some quite unusual angles, actually. There's some great action on the motorbikes as they're whizzing around the city. It's brilliantly photographed. The cinematography by a guy called Stefan Klupek is really, really good. And I thought that the story was engaging and engrossing. And when you realise that this gang, which is 
you know, it's a pretty brutal world that they live in when you realise that one of them is doing it for a particular good cause. It's the only way he can find to raise money living as an inner city kid for his drug addled mum is to turn to crime. But the money he's trying to raise, he wants to, to use to save his mum. I thought there was a really good moral story at the heart of this. It's exciting. It's tense. I thought that he didn't have states welcome at 102 minutes. Really, really good. Go see it. Gassed up. Mm, I okay. thought if you're into British crime or British thrillers, honestly, really, really good. Could easily slip under the radar, but, you know, didn't want yeah. to let it. Yeah. OK, that's good. Yes. Um, score out of 10. I gave it an eight. I mean, I thought it was just terrific from the start. OK, really good. eight out of 10. We normally want more than one view on these films before we give a score, but uh, as we are so lean this week, we'll uh, we'll have to go with that. So it's eight out of ten for a flickering yeah. dream score, making gassed up a hit. It definitely is for Mandy. Yeah. Right, okay, it's time now for a bit of this. The moment I dread every week. Okay, so there's only three of you this time. Uh, Dan two actually, oh, Dan. oh, indeed right. two, indeed two. Uh, Dan did the quiz offline a little bit earlier today. I've not heard from Emma, but um, if she gets back to me before this goes out, then maybe she can do it as well. But uh, as per normal in this quiz, I'm going to show you five pictures from a film that sits in the top 1,000 box office films, and you simply have to guess what the film is. So we're going to start now with picture one. And I have to say, Dan got this on picture two, so no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> oh. I've got something in mind. He's got something in mind. Is he going to write anything? No. No. I've got something in mind, but I'm not writing anything. Okay. We're going on to picture number two then. Dan's picture. <gasps> right. I should have went on one. Ah. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to fall behind this week. Well, maybe he's got it wrong. Yeah, I doubt it. Okay. <sighs> Here's picture number three. This is clearly too easy. I thought this was a hard one. I mean, it could be wrong. hard. Trust me, I think it's hard. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's um, the character <laughs> called. <laughs> Don't say out loud. For those playing along at home. Right, here's picture number four. Then you've all got something written down. Yeah, and finally, here's picture number five. Okay, so. What's your answers, guys? Sonic the Hedgehog on number three. Oh, oh it's oh, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. I was doubting myself towards the end there, and I was like, oh, no. Dear. So you... I was thinking, shall I go one or two? That's the problem with these oh, ones dear. for me. Oh, so, I... Not overly invested in these type of films and I never know whether it's one or two. Nothing. No, no, well, minus, minus ten, you'll think you'll find, Andy. Yeah. yeah. I did. I knew it on one as well. That was oh. the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Oh. Dan knew it on one as well, but it wasn't brave enough yeah. to put it down. So on that go, uh, Dan is now on 190 points. Uh, Scott is on 340 points and Andy I'm afraid is slipping back to 210 points so uh, Dan is hot on your heels Andy there yep. you go <laughs> yep so uh, so that was obviously the answer let me just show the answer picture was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 if in doubt always Knuckles. go with the sequel that's well, in the top thousand 
What position is that, that Bob? That is brace yourselves. That is number three hundred and forty-one in the top one thousand. You're making these up every week. You're I am not. <laughs> I it was so I... popular. All these yeah. kids' films are super high in the box. Yes, yeah, it's true, but. It just shows Man, why no. they make kids' films, doesn't it? They drag it in does. the box office. Uh, yeah, okay, so we'll be back to kids' films a little bit later on with the um, box office list. Going to move on now to a film on Disney Plus called Suncoast. And um, in Suncoast, quiet teenager Doris is having a difficult relationship with her mother, Christine. But there's a reason for that because her brother Max is suffering from brain cancer and is about to take his final one-way journey to Suncoast, the local Clearwater hospice. Here's a clip. Do you think this is the right place for him? You'd say that about any place. My brother's dying. He hasn't talked in years. I'm so sorry. My wife passed away. My dad died when I was three. Christ, it ain't competitions. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should start sleeping at Suncoast so your brother doesn't get too lonely. He's my child. When he's in pain, I'm in pain. I'm your child, too. What about God's sake? Give me a break. OK, so that is uh, is Suncoast. Wonderful performances in this, I have to say, from Nico Parker, who plays the, the uh, young girl, Doris. Uh, if you're thinking, where do I recognise her from? She played the young girl in the Tim Burton Dumbo film of uh, a couple of years ago. And she's also had various other. I thought the name was familiar. Yeah, also had various other uh, film roles, including that terrible Hugh Jackman uh, Transcendence um, film oh, from a couple of years ago. Yeah. This is written and directed by a lady called Laura Chin, and it's actually based on her own teenage life story. So Doris in this film is actually Laura as of about 20 years ago. Um, so it's a very, very personal story. She indeed had a brother called Max who did die of brain cancer in the same way as portrayed in the film. In fact, there's a, a little tribute uh, screen to him at the end of the film. And there's Woody Harrelson in this as well, as you saw from that clip. Um, he's also good in this as uh, somebody called Paul. One of my problems with this is that the character of Paul is kind of uh, something on something and nothing character. He doesn't really play much of a role in the plot other than being a shoulder for Doris to cry on occasionally. I mean, to be honest, I was glad that a friendship between a cute young teen and a, an older middle-aged guy didn't have ulterior motives buried in there. So that was quite refreshing. But as a story element, it didn't really go anywhere for me. In fact, that's probably my criticism of the film in general, because there's a parallel story going on here. Um, and another true life story about a famous euthanasia case, uh, that of Terry Shiva, Shiva, who was basically in this same hospice on end of life care. And her husband basically wanted to turn off life support after 15 years or whatever. And there was a big campaign and uh, protests and everything at the hospice about this and and that plot never really quite intersects with the main plot of what's going on with Max at all I expected it to and Paul is one of the protesters but it never really did anything right so um so it's a bit of an odd film it's it's a good film I think in that it tackles subjects of death and grief and hospice which is not your typical run-of-the-mill um, storylines for a movie. And it actually does it very well. There are some very, very great uh, moments for Laura Linney in this, um, who plays the most unlikable character of the mother, at least at the start of the film. So on that basis, it is well worth a watch. But it's got a few rough edges, which uh, took the um, shine off it for me. I gave this one a 7 out of 10 because it is a worth a watch so that's a flickering dream score of seven just based on me again which makes it a borderline hit <laughs> but certainly worth your time right let's have a look now at the box office top 10 we had a little prediction as to what would be no number one this week and indeed <laughs> we were right that it's migration having taken two of my grandkids to the cinema to see this on monday 
the cinema was so packed that we actually had to sit in different parts of the cinema until we kindly had a word with wow. somebody and moved people around. So there was not a seat to be had at virtually any of the showings in the cinema that we were in. So it is certainly packing them in. It's made 6.6 .6 million in its two week run so far. I actually agreed with you guys from last week. I think we gave it a six out of 10 overall. Yeah. My two grandkids respectively gave it a 8.9 out of 10, very precise. <laughs> We and a nine, we're not the target audience, <laughs> and a nine point five out of ten. So they really enjoyed it, yeah. uh, and it, it it is a nice kind of family watch. Good to take the kids to at half term. So for that reason, I I, I think it's certainly um, certainly good. But for me, it kind of lacked a bit of momentum in places. There's a whole section with a a heron uh, family, which is a little bit odd, stuck into it. And not this film's fault, but it, it does reproduce a whole s sequence out of Chicken Run 2, uh, as we talked about last week, just just by accident. Uh, at number two in the chart is Argyle, which I'm going to see tomorrow. I'm in catch-up mode after my COVID uh, confinement from last week. But Argyle has made uh, close to four million in its two-week run, so that's doing pretty well. The you. Iron Claw, which came out last Friday... Uh, first week in the charts made just under a million quid. Uh, All of the Strangers, my film of the year so far, possibly in my greatest of all time list, I have to say, is at number four. That's made close to four million. If you haven't seen it, uh, go out and see it. Have you seen it yet, Scott? Not had a chance yet, Bob. <sighs> Try and see all of the strangers. It's a cracking film because I want to talk to you about the ending. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the ending. What happens at the end? <laughs> at number five, at number five, God help us. God help the parents. We've got Pepper's Cinema Party with Pepper. It Pitt. is half term. It is half term. This one is definitely aimed at the under fives, and uh, that is at number five in the charts. Still hanging on at number six is Mean Girls, uh, made seven and a half million pounds so far, fourth week in the chart. At number seven, still hanging on, is Anyone But You, Andy's favourite, uh, eight weeks in the chart. Uh, American Fiction is not in the top ten. I know. But that's still in the top 10. I know. American Somebody Fiction is, is about me, number 13 or 14 in the list, but that's uh, that's dropped out. And yet, like anyone with you is. Uh, I know. Made close to 10 million quid, so it's doing good business. Still in the chart as well. We did predict that this would uh, stay in the chart for half term, is Wonka. Uh, that's been 10 weeks in the charts, made 61 million quid, so it's just slowly adding on. Uh, money the zone of interest which i saw today second week in the charts made 1.2 million pounds and the reissue of Score june 10, Bob. The zone um, of interest. i would probably go a seven i'm somewhat between so you made it yeah i'm somewhat yeah. well I, I as a film i mean it it really lays out the banality of life going on next to this horrific event going on next door as you talked about yeah and it does it very well but the banality is still banal and okay. for, for me it was an interesting project and it was done in an interesting fashion and it, uh, jonathan glazer is a very good filmmaker for for sure but would i would i rush to go back and see it again no, no i wouldn't no, no, no. no i would so it's it, I, I'm kind of hovering between a six and a seven, to be honest, in, in okay. my score of it. But I thought it was very good for what it did. I thought it, the message was very important. Didn't really grab me as a film. And I rather resent it if this has taken the Oscar slot from all of the strangers getting in, to be honest. At number 10, we have the reissue of June ahead of June 2 coming out. Uh, that has made a total box office through its last release and into this new release of twenty-two and a half million pounds. So that's um, mad. It is mad, isn't it? But there you go. Okay, that is the box office for this week. What do we think will be at number one next week? Well, 
I mean, to be honest, I think migration might still be. <laughs> I think it'll still be migration. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it will be because it still have term. But yeah, there's a I couple of films out that I mean would challenge it. Will the Bob Marley film challenge it? Or I don't think so. Not. Probably not. Madam Web probably won't challenge. People it either, don't know don't it's think. a superhero film as much. No, it's a bit of a slow time, isn't it? Um, yeah, at the box office at the moment, we just seem to have entered a bit of a slump. Okay. Well, if anyone uh, but you is still in the top ten. <laughs> Well, it is coming back out here in their special encore Valentine's Day edition. I noticed that. Scott, even though noticed it hasn't that. left the cinema, so I'm not sure how it's coming back. But okay, there we go. I did notice that, and I made note yeah. of that. Well, if they could, if they could have a reunion in my big fat three, <laughs> wedding three, then they could do it for that film. Okay, we're we're moving on now to another film. This is on Netflix. It's a documentary that we've all seen. This is Lover Stalker killer uh scott can you introduce that to us yeah so this one is a netflix documentary where we see a guy who has separated from his wife tries online dating for the first time with some very unexpected consequences here's a clip i was starting over as a single person and i was determined to enjoy it that's when carrie farver came into my life our first date, I had made it clear I was absolutely not going to be tied down. She says, Lord, this is just fun. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I'm in. So I'm not really the target audience a lot of the time for these true crime documentaries, serial killer series. Um, I think this is more Emma's bag, so I would have been interested to hear her side of this one. For me... I thought the story was quite interesting. We get the setup of who this guy is and the fact that he starts using plenty of fish to basically have some fun, just meet some people now that he's living on his own. And he meets a woman called Liz and has some fun there, starts dating her, and then soon dates another woman called Kari. And through some interesting circumstances, she starts sending him, Kari that is, starts sending him some strange harassing text messages which slowly get more threatening and more dangerous and she just comes across as this crazy psychopath. We see that his mind is getting messed up and investigators are trying to find out what's happened and all this time, by the way, Kari's went missing so nobody actually knows where she is. So investigators are trying to find her to stop her doing these harassing texts. And everyone is feeling quite dangerous because these texts suddenly become actual physical harm in various means. I don't want to speak too much about the second half of this film because then we're very much getting into spoiler territory. I'm, I'm trying to be very careful even what I say because it's very, very easy to spoil something. There's a certain word that I want to use, but even saying that word gives it away. So I'm not going to say it. On the whole, I liked it. I did think it got a little bit slow in terms of the rate that they were speaking and with all the scenes, that the way they were cutting it together. And uh, although I've never really done this before, I found myself, I actually put up the speed to <laughs> 1.5 on Netflix and it didn't really make much of a difference. It, it just I didn't, I didn't it sounded fine. Yeah, it no, sounded like they were speaking normally, which made me think through. how slow they were do going before. But yeah, I thought I'll try that just to see if that makes any difference with the pacing. And it actually made it better at 1.5 speed. And I didn't feel like they were speaking too fast. So I would recommend doing that if you're going to watch this. <laughs> I think I liked it. I'm not sure. I feel like I wanted something more. I can't quite put my finger on what it is that I wanted. Maybe a little bit more style, perhaps, but this might be a budget thing or a directorial thing. I'm not quite sure. Andy? Uh, Scott just said he wanted more. I wanted less. I mean, what is it, an hour and a half long? Yeah, I did an, think. If, and if this had been an hour? If this had been an hour, a really tight, taut documentary telling a really unusual story with twists and turns that nobody could see coming, I think this would have been absolutely fascinating. Well, if you play as it, it at 1.5 like speed, then it will be an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, as it was, Scott, like you, I mean, I got a little bit bored. 
I was thinking, speed up, tell me the story. There's long scenes of people staring into space and cars driving down roads and all sorts of stuff that, that are just time fillers, really, and actually time wasters. For what is an unusual true crime story that's worth knowing and that's worth seeing, mm. but make it an hour, yeah. you know. Tell me the story. Just don't drag it out. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know. the, the story yeah. is the reason to watch this, isn't I it? I couldn't yeah. imagine actually this being turned into a drama. You couldn't imagine it being turned into a movie. Yeah. 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 For yeah. Sure. yeah that would be. That would have been better. <clears throat> it would I work. Think. It and, would work. Know, based on a true story, but Definitely. as it is, mm. I got. I, I, I start to lose interest. The, the the thing that really got to me was the degree of mansplaining going on. Yeah. Right, that yeah. that they couldn't let any single comment kind of lie without explaining what they meant. At, at one point, they put a tracker on a car. So so he said, right, we put a tracker on a car, right? But then he goes on to say, so we knew its GPS coordinates at any time we wanted. And the whole film is full of that. Just, yeah. Yeah. just we know yeah. what a, we know what a yeah. tracker is. You do not have to mansplain <laughs> that to us, okay? Ah, oh, it, it drove me a little bit crazy. But the story, I think, was agree was was very good. But as an overall documentary, it just lacked pace for me completely. I gave this one a five out of ten. Scott, originally I was going to say seven, but as we're talking about it, I'm going <laughs> to take it down to a six. Okay. Yeah, and with Scott, I gave it a six, Bob. Six. That's twelve. Uh, that's going to be. A Five point six six for the flickering dream score. So good scorey. Shame about the documentary makes it a miss. As for Lover Stalker Killer on Netflix. That being said, it's still up number one in the Netflix chart, or or was when I saw it at the weekend. So uh, it's doing fairly good business. Uh, our final film we're looking at today is one called The Promised Land and this looks like a strange 18th century Danish western to me but um, Andy can you introduce the clip? Here's a clip from The Promised Land which is a strange 18th century Danish western. <laughs> Here's a clip. Do we have to dyrke heden? I will build the Kongs first to come out. It's fantastic that you're going with. I feel the feeling of life here out Heden er Guds natur i al sin pragt. Hvorfor kastrerer et vildt bæs, der bare kan møde af frit? Den har Gud netop ikke sat mennesker på jorden for at skabe civilisation. Gud er kæres. Livet er kæres. Nej, krig er kæres. Men vinderen er den, som kan finde ud af at kontrollere kæres. Ja, yeah, det looks good. It does look good. This is, this is really very, very good, and it's showing in cinemas, including Cineworld, this weekend. So we are in 1755... Mads Mikkelsen plays Captain Ludwig Kallen, who is an impoverished Danish officer who's just come out of uh, 25 years serving in the German army. He requests permission to tame some land in northern Denmark known as the Danish Junta. It's a wild, barren, unpopulated bit of land. And he gets permission from the Danish royal court to tame it. Everybody says it's impossible. Everybody says you're never be able to tame, you'll never be able to farm this land, you'll never be able to cultivate it, you'll never be able to do anything with this land. He says, I can do it. And with the help of some Danish refugees, he does. However, once he starts to get some success, once he starts to actually begin to um, make progress, building a house, building a farm on the land, some nearby nobles decide that they are going to take interest. <laughs> they dig up some very old documents which actually proves that they own the land and they have the right to it. And it becomes a battle. And there is a degree of uh, violence involved. There is a degree of uh, fighting. And it's all about merciless landowners trying to monopolise a piece of land. It's a really good drama. It's a really good film. I only saw it on my laptop because I was sent a, a screener by the film's publicity company. I'm, looking, I, I'm actually going to go and see this on the big screen. Because um, the, the the landscapes, the cinematography, absolutely fantastic. As you would expect, Mad Mickelson, I think gives a gives a great performance. I think he's really good in whatever he does. And generally, honestly, this is a zany Danish 18th century western. There That's you go. the best way to describe it, Bob. You summed it up beautifully. And I really think it's worth seeing. It's quite long. I'm <clears> just <throat> checking the running time. It's it's over two hours, 127 minutes. But 
honestly, go sit on the big screen. As I said, I've only seen it on my laptop, mm. and I was gripped. Okay. And I'm looking forward to seeing it on the big you, screen. You, Worth seeing. I, I did have a little Google at my uh, Cineworld listings. I couldn't immediately see it at my... Okay, well, it's on, at my it's definitely on in Milton Keynes on, on Friday okay. here. So some are showing it. Score out of 10, Andy? Oh, I go in eight. It's really gripping. Eight. Making really gripping, it's really exciting, it's really good. Making the promised yeah. land a hit based on Andy's view. So we'll uh, we'll try and catch that if we can. Okay, that's uh, the end of our films. Uh, in terms of AOB, just a quick comment: it's the Baftas on Sunday night coming up. Um, for the first time in many years, I'm actually <laughs> Andy's asleep. First time in many years, I'm going to miss the live performance um, because uh, I'm I'm away. But uh, I will catch up on it. And I am going to publish later in the week my predictions on onemansmovies.com for who's going to win. And I'm sure, Scott, you're going to do it as well. I've I thought not I'll, looked at the list properly yet, but yeah, I, I, think I I'll try and, plan to do that. I think I'll try and get my list out before you publish the correct answers uh, <laughs> in your predictions. <laughs> I don't know, Barter's a lot more difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are some really tricky categories, I think, this year. Uh, for, but even for that, sure. just with the, the way it's judged, it's very difficult to know. Yeah, like, they could yeah. go wild with like a Viviana Parra for lead actress or something random like that. Yeah, it's, yes. It's, I might I go just, for some random picks just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> I just say, I was at Mark Commode's monthly show at the British Film Institute last night, yeah. and he was, he was publicising the Girls on Film Podcast Award. Yeah. And they are the only group amongst all the awards that I've seen that I've including in their list of nominees, typist, artist, pirate king. Yes. <laughs> and I was punching the air last night. Also, uh, talking of things that keep you awake and, oh no, the BAFTAs is during the evening here, not like the Oscars, <laughs> but many, many bleary eyed people on Monday morning were bleary eyed because they watched the Super Bowl. And uh, Scott, you were one of them. And one of the famous things that happens during the Super Bowl advert breaks is that some of the big hitter trailers get their first premiere. Yeah, I was up for Super Bowl um, as usual and got to bed at about quarter past four and didn't book the day off work. So that was <laughs> interesting. But yeah, we got some big hitters coming during the first half. So the one that most people are talking about on the internet is Deadpool and Wolverine, which looks pretty good. Very Deadpool heavy within the actual trailer itself. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be more trailers that reveal a bit more of Hugh Jackman. So, but I thought, although I'm not a massive fan of the series, like I quite like Deadpool. I did not like Deadpool too. This one, I'm curious about because it's yeah. going to be mixing it into the MCU now. And it's going to be very, like, you can even tell with some of the jokes in here how meta it's going to be and self-referential. Indeed. Let's, let's just see a little clip. Ah, great. We did say that we were going to feature in this slot one of the uh, trailers of the summer blockbusters. And so this is the one that I've picked from Deadpool and Wolverine. Here's a clip. Why am I here? Walk with me. Wait. You are special. This is your chance to be a hero among heroes. I smell what you're stepping in, Sensei. Your little cinematic universe is about to change forever. I'm the Messiah. I am Marvel Jesus. Yeah, I think that looks uh, very funny. I mean, horribly blasphemous, but he's Marvel <laughs> Jesus, right? If if ever there was a need for a second coming in the Marvel Universe, uh, I think now is it. So uh, maybe he's it. <laughs> Deadpool versus uh, Deadpool versus Deadpool and Wolverine is out on July the 25th. So it's really one of the real heavy hitter summer blockbuster slots, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, about to be one of the year's top grocers, I suspect. I, I have to confess, so. when I first heard it and read what you guys were talking about, I thought that we were looking at two films, one about Deadpool and one about Wolverine. Oh, <laughs> no, no. It's both. Very interesting combination. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We know what the sort of off screen relationship with Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, how yeah. much fun those guys have together. So I can only yeah. imagine on screen. Imagine, it's yeah, going to be so much fun. I think so. Um, but this any was others? not. Yeah, this was not the big one for me. There's two films that we saw trailers for that are films that were in my most anticipated films for 2024. One of them is Wicked, part one. That's <laughs> annoying, but we saw Cynthia Revo and Ariana Grande. We didn't quite get the musical thing, but it seems to be a theme this year with musicals. They're not Let's showing it. the music in the trailers. Let's hide no. the fact they're musicals. It's a musical, but don't tell anybody. We'll have the cats and <laughs> Les Miserables and some other musical films that have been so poor. <gasps> Um, I mean, that's just an attack on two, Tom Hooper right there with those two films. But, but it was, um, what was the... Sorry, what was one, the, I thought they were really poor, both. Of what them. was the one by the Hamilton guy? Um, Le Mans Bon Miranda. The, the Heights. In the Heights. In the, the Heights. Heights. That was quite good. I quite liked yeah. that. I think that was quite good, but it bombed at the box office, I think. It, that was a bad time. The story timing. was very yeah. good, I thought. Yeah, so I, I think that's ten probably ten, the that film one. which is kind of pushing this little trend yeah. here, like the colour yeah. purple and let's just sneak I think my, my problem in. with Les Mes... Scott was I adore the stage show. I think the stage show okay. is the greatest thing, not since sliced bread, but since bread. And I just didn't <laughs> think the film of Les Mis did it any justice whatsoever. I, I'd seen just the film before I'd seen any stage, stage productions, mm. okay. so I had that. You but... haven't seen Les Mis until you've seen the stage show. That's Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. The big trailer for me. It's my worry though... about Wicked as well, to be honest. Yeah, I'm a little concerned, but the production looks incredible. The big trailer for me, though, was my most anticipated film for this year, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which we already got a bit of a trailer, but this one is an expanded trailer, and it just looks so amazing. I it, want it, and I want it now. It does look good. Even though Matt Reeves is no longer the director, I'm still invested in this movie franchise. I think it's going to be amazing. I really i am keeping all my fingers and toes crossed <laughs> that it does not disappoint because my expectations are so high for it. Yeah. And the trailer is selling me on that. There's nothing about it that's making me think, oh, no, it's just making me more hyped. Yeah, indeed. indeed the original is. Apes film is in my all-time top ten. Interesting. The Charlton Heston one. Well, as in Charlton Heston. I love yeah. that film. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I I liked all of the previous trilogy with Caesar. Mm, I have to say, yeah, I yeah. think they were all um, really terrific films, particularly the last one, which I I really enjoyed. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what this one is like. Um, see if <laughs> they seem to be trying to milk a cow a little bit here in terms <laughs> of. Uh, I thought that trilogy was going to be it, but again, if they can do another Jurassic World film, then they can do another Planet of the Apes film. And they'll probably do it a lot better. Can episode. I just mention one thing, oh, yeah. Bob, very quickly? Sure. There's a film that's coming on streaming services. Don't ask me which ones, but you'll have to look for it. This weekend called Head Count, which somebody described as a Quentin Tarantino movie directed by the Coen brothers. <laughs> I've seen it. I think that's a pretty accurate description, <laughs> actually. It's a very unusual... We start with a guy with a gun being held to his head and somebody's playing Russian roulette with him, you know, which click of the, of the thing will blow his brains out. And with each click and the bullet doesn't come, he's remembering in the past how that bullet was fired kind of thing. So he's flashing back. Oh, yeah, I shot so-and-so. That was that bullet. I shot so-and-so. That was that bullet. So it's a load of flashbacks. But it's a really clever film. It's really good. So it's going to be on streaming. So it's called Head Count. I promised the producers, because they sent me a, a screener, that I would give it a flag up. It's, it's, it's a, definitely a, a 7 out of 10. It's called Head Count. Okay. Quentin Let's... Tarantino, directed by the Coen brothers. Okay. That's well, if we, look for that. out for it. If we uh, see it ourselves, let's uh, review it properly in the yeah. mm -hmm. upcoming... Yeah, it's, it's good. Good. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. Thank you very much to Scott and Andy, and uh, we will possibly see you next week, minus me. Uh, but if not, we'll see you in two weeks' time for another edition of Flickering Dreams. <laughs> that was our 50th show. I'm off to gorge myself on birthday cake. So, uh, right. Thanks, guys. See you next week. God bless, guys. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you so much for listening or watching Flickering Dreams. You can find the video version on YouTube and the audio version on all major podcast platforms. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get each of the weekly episodes as they are released. We'll see you at the movies.